We are introduced to a 14-year-old boy named John Smith. He resides in Missouri with his adopted parents, Joyce and Brian Smith. John goes to a Christian middle school and is quite popular among his friends. He's a star on his basketball team, enjoys listening to pop music, and has a crush on a girl named Abby. Despite the love and support of his parents, John struggles with thoughts of abandonment from his birth parents. Therefore, his behavior towards his parents and teachers is frequently cold and distant. Joyce, a devoted mother and a person of unwavering faith, makes an effort to communicate with her son despite his efforts to remove himself from her. She's still there, taking him to his activities, forcing him to go to church with the family on Sundays, and driving him to school and practices. In the next scene, the students are required to present a brief history of their families. When it's John's turn to do the presentation, he admits that he hasn't completed the assignment because he didn't have enough time. His teacher warns him that if he doesn't do the homework, he might fail the subject, but he doesn't seem to care. Based on real events, Breakthrough is a movie where John falls through the ice on a frozen lake in Missouri. Trapped underwater for more than 15 minutes, rescuers bring John back to the surface and rush him to the nearest hospital. While doctors fear the worst, the 14-year-old boy continues to fight for his life. His parents and their pastor stay by his side and pray for a miracle. Now let's get back to the movie. A while later, we see John playing basketball at the school where he engages in a fight with a kid named Chad. In the meantime, his basketball coach shows up and splits them. The coach also informs him that he would be benched if he receives a failing grade. Hearing this, John becomes upset because despite his disinterest in studies, basketball is quite important to him. Therefore, the next day, he gives a brief presentation in which he says that everyone is aware of his adoption. He further says that his parents adopted him while traveling as missionaries in Latin America and that he is clueless about most of his actual family history. Meanwhile, Joyce meets with other ladies in a worship group. Jason, the new pastor, arrives and interrupts her, saying that he and his group are coming in for their meeting and that he didn't see the sign-up sheet for Joyce's group on the door. Hearing this, she becomes annoyed and it seems that she doesn't really like the pastor. She says that she dislikes Jason's preaching approach, and particularly his hairstyle. Later, the Smith family attends church, where Jason preaches. By inviting rappers and singers, he makes every effort to win over the entire assembly, including young and old people. A while later, he tries to converse with the Smiths, but Joyce is quite mean to him, and John finds him silly and cheesy. However, Brian is quite polite to him. After that, John goes to play basketball and helps his team to win the game. Later, he stays over with his friends Josh and Ryger in their house. The next day, it's Martin Luther King's day, and the three boys go to an icy lake to play. In the meantime, a nearby resident warns them against playing there, since it might not be safe. Also, he threatens to call the police on them if they won't stop playing there. However, the kids continue playing there despite the man's warning. While John checks his mother's text message, he unexpectedly slips through the ice. At the same time, Josh and Ragnar also fall in the water with him. When the neighbor notices this, he makes a rescue call. Responding to the call shortly after, firefighters rush to the site to save the boys. Josh and Ragnar are successfully extracted, while John is still down after being knocked out. When the firefighters are about to give up, one of the rescuers, Tommy, overhears a voice urging him to go back. Thinking it's his chief's voice, he tries again, and this time, he successfully pulls John to the surface. When John is brought to the hospital in a critical condition, the medical staff tries to save him, but they're unable to find his pulse. It's revealed that he was trapped underwater for more than 15 minutes. It seems that John was submerged in the icy lake for a lot longer than the brain can function without oxygen. When Joyce hears about the accident, she heads straight for the hospital. Tearfully, she also calls Brian and asks him to immediately come to the hospital. Meanwhile, the hospital's medical staff is certain that John won't live for very long. Dr. Stutterer offers Joyce the opportunity to say her last goodbyes to her son, seeing he has no chance of survival. Joyce, who is absolutely distraught, weeps over John and starts pleading with God to save her son. Fortunately, after she finishes her prayer, John is able to register a very faint pulse. The medical staff is astonished by what happened and how it occurred. Since it's a sign of hope, Dr. Stutterer advises Joyce to send John to a hospital with superior technology and recommends Dr. Garrett as he's an expert in such drowning cases. Then he returns home. 
where his daughter, Abby, who is John's crush and classmate, starts asking questions about his health. He's unsure of what to say and doesn't want to raise her expectations. However, he says to her that John's survival is a miracle and that he has never witnessed anything so remarkable in his life. In the following scene, John is moved to another hospital under the supervision of Dr. Garrett, where he's put in a medically induced coma. Dr. Garrett informs Joyce and Brian that John's chances of survival are extremely low. He continues by saying that even if John were to unexpectedly live, his brain would be neurologically injured and he would spend the rest of his life in a persistent vegetative state. However, Joyce is confident and hopeful that John will make it through somehow. Next, Tommy hears about John's situation from his co-workers. He claims he believes the voice ordering him to go back during the accident was a chief, but the chief denies saying anything. According to the chief, the only possible explanation must be God. However, Tommy reveals that he doesn't believe in God. In the meantime, other people from the church and school began to express their support. Even the local news reports on John's story and Pastor John also shows up in the hospital. He offers to stay with John so Joyce and Brian can relax for some time. But Joyce is somewhat irritated by his presence because she doesn't like him that much. However, she gradually begins to soften towards him as she observes his sincere care and support. Just like Joyce, Jason also seems to realize that there is a divine intervention in John's progress. After several days, John starts to appear to be conscious. Joyce is holding John's hand as she says she can feel him squeezing it. Meanwhile, Jason also takes John's other hand and the two of them begin to ask him about basketball to seek his opinion. Similarly, when John asks him who is the greatest basketball player among LeBron and Jordan, Jordan responds to them by squeezing their hands. They're delighted with his response and try to demonstrate to Dr. Garrett, but are unsuccessful to get out a response from John at this time. In the hospital, Joyce doesn't budge from John's side. On the other hand, Brian doesn't visit John very often. Meanwhile, Joyce gets resentful toward other parents and doctors who speak negatively about John's condition. She makes John's potential recovery her obsession, continuously bugging the medical staff to put John first, alienating everyone around her, including her own spouse. Brian tries to persuade her to control her emotions and show kindness toward others, but she asks him why he isn't staying at John's side in such a tough circumstance. But Brian responds to her by expressing how heartbroken he is to see John in this situation. In an intense argument, Joyce claims to Brian that John would have died without her. Hearing this, Brian storms off after a short and harsh response. In the following scene, Joyce goes to the hospital's roof for a prayer session after realizing she can't influence John's outcome and begs God for forgiveness and submission to his plan. Meanwhile, it begins to snow, which she believes is an answer. Shortly after, she heads downstairs and apologizes to Brian. Then the two then turn to check out John's room window and notice that his classmates and other community members have gathered to sing for him. Then, they see a tear trickling down John's cheek. A while later, Tommy visits John in the hospital to see how he's doing, and Joyce thanks him for saving his son's life. In his response, Tommy tells her he was only carrying out his duty and wishes him well and leaves. The following day, Dr. Garrett informs Joyce and Brian that the medications they have been giving to John to help him wake up might be more harmful than helpful. He continues by saying that John can't carry on like this for very long. Joyce has been determined about saving John's life at any cost, but she advises removing the medication and waking him up as she is prepared for whatever comes. In the next scene, the medical team awakens John from his coma and gets ready for whatever comes next. Meanwhile, John starts having terrible seizures before he's sedated. In an effort to gain John's attention, Joyce tries to have a conversation with him. In the meantime, John swims to the surface while revealing the day of his accident which corresponds to when he wakes up. As he opens his eyes, Joyce asks him if he can recall who she is. He addresses her as his mother, and everyone is delighted to hear from him. Meanwhile, John's friends receive texts from Joyce, and the word spreads quickly around the school about his recovery. Later, his friends also visit him in the hospital. When Abby enters and gives him a hug, they all tease and poke fun at him. 28 days after the accident, John returns to school. His classmates and teachers congratulate and applaud him on returning healthfully. Following a class, his teacher shares with John how her husband passed away from an aneurysm while he was sleeping and wonders why God chooses to save certain people while not others. 
John finds himself at a loss for words, so he simply says he's sorry and leaves. In the meantime, he realizes some kids resent him for why his life was saved while their loved ones perished. In the following scene, John gets upset and rides his bike to a lake and finds Tommy there. He expresses gratitude to Tommy for saving him. However, Tommy responds that all he did was pull John from the water and says that up until these recent events, he didn't believe in God, but now he does. It's Sunday, and John goes to church with his family. In the meantime, Pastor Jason calls his family to the stage, where John and Joyce express their gratitude to everyone for their support with tears in their eyes. Then, Jason asks everybody to stand up and display their collective prayers for John's well recovery. John rebuilds his ties with those he had been alienating and reconciles his survival with a newfound sense of purpose in his life. In the epilogue that follows, it's revealed that the Smith family still resides in Missouri and gets along well with Pastor Jason. At present, John intends to coach basketball in addition to pursuing a career in the ministry. The end. Hope you enjoyed it. What was your favorite part? Do comment down below. Make sure to hit the like button. It helps the channel tremendously, and if you haven't done already, consider subscribing. Check out the next video if you fancy more recaps from us. Enjoy!